Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll begin then. Good morning and thank you for coming. Uh, like Professor Rastifo mentioned, my project is titled Silent Music and Sacred Sounds of the Hoysalas, Visual and Oral Sensory Experience in Jain and Hindu Temples. So this project examined affective responses to temple spaces and investigated how sensorial stimulation can amplify people's experiences in Jain and Hindu temples. It's focused on architecture, particularly medieval religious architecture of the Hoysala Empire, which who ruled in the present South Indian state of Karnataka between the 10th century and 14th century CE. They were one of the strongest proponents of Jainism in Karnataka. Through textual analysis and ethnographic work, this research studied the traditional methods of temple designing and planning and how they participate in and shape contemporary South Indian devotion with a focus on two 12th century temples built during the Hoysala rule in Karnataka, the Jain Pashwanatha Basadi and the Hindu Vaishnava Chenna Keshava temple. So Basadi in language of Kannada from Karnataka uh, means Jain temple. Um, and Vaishnava, Hindu Vaishnava tradition means it's a Hindu tradition which, uh, in which Lord Vishnu is viewed as the supreme deity. So I argue that the architectural elements and design of these temples are instrumental in shaping visitors' affective responses to temple spaces and in amplifying their experiences through visual and sensory stimulation. Through qualitative interviews conducted with the visitors and devotees of these temples, this research explored the varied definitions of devotional experience. Through the theoretical idea of placemaking, it renders the Hoysala architecture as a placemaking device that enriches the Jain and Hindu devotees' experiences through art, sound, music, moving beyond the typical focus on the objects of worship. So I believe that. Uh, some of us, if not all, have personal reasonings as motivations for choosing a research topic. So my uh, interest in the Hoysalas began uh, in my childhood and it was heavily influenced by my late grandfather who was a Yakshagana artist. So Yakshagana is a folk dance from um, South India. So for his uh, performances and for, his, uh, for creative inspirations, he would travel around the world, across the country, and one of his such visits was to uh, the Hoysala monuments. And he returned from uh, his uh, travels and he would just narrate his experiences vividly of this art in the Hoysala, of the Hoysala monuments and temples. And he would try to emulate the postures of these uh, dancing sculptures. And he left this memory in me and he instilled this curiosity in me. And that has now culminated in this master's research project. So I come from a family of uh, musicians and performing artists, and also I have an undergraduate degree in architecture. So my earliest interests in this subject as a thesis project matured from the question, do architecture and performing art at worship places influence the way we see and feel religion and uplift our devotional experience? I picked these two distinct religious sites to collect eclectic ethnographic findings and to bring to the foreground medieval South Indian religious pluralism and cultural syncretism exhibited through their building designs. I pursued answers to these questions. How did the religious history of the Hoysalas shape the Jain and Hindu temples? What do the Jain and Hindu texts say about aesthetics and performing arts and rituals? How are they linked to sensuous pleasures? What architectural foundations and principles guided the Jain and Hindu temple construction under the Hoysalas? What makes devotion a sensorial experience? How does the architecture of these temples work as a placemaking device? So my field research and the subsequent interviews with the visitors also pointed to a perspective where the main image of worship is decentralized and my research objective evolved to demonstrate that the visitors at both the temples are visually stimulated right from the entrance to final viewing of the image at the sanctum, intensifying their hope and anticipation. Uh, so a little bit about the religious background of the Hoysalas. Mm -hmm. According to around 10th century CE, there was this uh, village chief in Karnataka who was called as uh, Sala. And he had this Jain teacher or Jain guru 
who was called as Sudatta. So Sudatta and Sala were offering uh, worship to a goddess in a temple in the dense forest of Karnataka when they happened to encounter a tiger. So um, Sudatta, the Jain guru, is said to have handed over a rod to Sala and asked him to strike the tiger, beat the tiger. And he screamed while handing over the rod to him, Hoi Sala, which means strike Sala in uh, Hale Kannada or Old Kannada language. So um, Sala is said to have taken this rod, struck the tiger, killed the tiger. So this is like the most circulated origin story of how the cry of this Jain Guru Sudatta Poi Sala was later adopted as a royal family name Hoi Sala. And how the image representing Sala uh, attacking the tiger became the royal emblem. And it appears in every Hoi Sala temple even today. Although this is considered folklore, there are certain inscriptions dated between 1123 and 1284 CE found in Karnataka that do mention Sala and the Jain uh, sage Sudatta. So this shows that Jainism had a firm hold uh, on the Hoysala kingdom since its inception. So the successors of Sala continued to support Jainism, notably King Vishnuvardhana, who was a Jain devotee, also embraced Hindu tradition of Vaishnavism. Because this was a period in uh, South India where one could accept and practice multiple religions while staying true to Jainism. The king also practiced three Hindu traditions. Personally, the king could worship any god of his choice, but socially it was his duty to acknowledge all four traditions. And this, this was termed as Chatus Samayagalu in Kannada. So King Vishnuvardhana contributed, therefore he contributed to the construction of both the Pashanatha Basadi and Chenakeshava temple. So it is this religious history that prompted me in picking two different religious uh, sites for my exploration. So when it comes to sensuous experiences in Jain uh, and Hindu ontology and rituals, there are many Hindu texts like Bhagavata Purana, Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu Samhita, Sri Vaishnava, that uh, suggest that sensory capabilities are crucial in Vaishnava pujas or worship rituals. And there are scholars like Diana Eck who have also stated that in India, worship rituals can be sensuous because the culture celebrates the realms of the senses by seeing the deity, by tasting the concentrated food or uh, water, by touching the deity, by smelling the incense uh, or the flowers, and by hearing the mantra chants, hymns, religious music, and so on. So I argue that affective responses in devotees can be generated through such sensory activations at worship places. When it comes to Jainism, however, there is an emphasis on asceticism in worship, Asceticism is glorified and turned into a colorful spectacle through artistic and aesthetically pleasing decorations, dance, drama, and music. The eternal tension between the monastic's ascetic regulations and the lay people's celebratory ways remains an intrinsic part of Jain culture and devotional expressions. So in Jain ontology, when a Jina or a Tirthankara, whom the Jains view as uh, this um, perfect living being, uh, when he is born on earth, um, it is believed that the celestial beings from heaven, they descend down upon earth to celebrate his birth through dance and music performances. So the Jains often find themselves in this liminal space between the sensual and ascetic worlds. And I argue that this space promotes sensuous devotionalism in, in Jainism. So with this background on Hoysala's religious with this background on Hoysala's religious history and significance of sensuous experiences in Jain and Hindu rituals, I now move on to the traditional Indian architectural texts that mention three types of temple architecture, the Nagara style, the Dravida style, and the Vesara style. The Nagara style is associated with the Northern region of India. The Dravida style is associated with Southern region of India, and the Vesara is associated with the Central region of India. But uh, Adam Hardy, an architectural historian and an architect who's currently designing a new Hoysala style temple in Karnataka, um, he writes that Karnataka's Dravida temple architecture style evolved from other earlier types of Dravida, Nagara, and Vesara temples, as the Karnataka architects delighted in producing hybrid forms. And I agree with him that although Hoysala style is categorized under Karnataka Dravida style, it is actually a hybrid product. There are also other rule books or shastras on the construction process and associated rituals um, of the traditional temples, which apply mathematical calculations, geographical conditions, astrology, astronomy, position of the sun, moon, etc., to scout buildings and design, uh, scout locations and design buildings. 
So these Shastras also speak of Panchabhutas or five elements of nature and how their presence or absence in a specific uh, space can activate the human senses. For instance, the temple sanctums are usually intentionally created windowless and scantily lit to play with the sunlight, which is the light from the gigantic source of the natural element fire, uh, to stimulate the senses. By the time the devotees approach the dark, dimly lit sanctum from the sunny, bright exteriors, their minds are calmed and relaxed to finally surrender to the divine. So the traditional Indian temple's ideology focused on how humans experience space and connected and formed a relationship with it. So this brings me to my theory of, uh, to the theory of placemaking, which I have used throughout my thesis. Um, so the placemaking concept was introduced in Western scholarship in the 1970s, and it further, it was further developed, um, inspired by the works of urbanists Jane Jacobs and William White. Placemaking is about the time spent by people in public space, making time spent by people in public spaces meaningful. It's about generating and transforming public areas according to people's needs and wishes. It's about humanizing spaces. And I propose that it is like traditional Indian planning, where the historic temple creators sought to make the time spent by people in public spaces purposeful through sensory interactions. And this can be seen in both the uh, Parshwanatha Vasadi and the Chenna Keshava temple. So in my field uh, research, I personally observed and experienced the phenomenon of Paisala temples. Mm -hmm. I interviewed 26 adults from different backgrounds mm -hmm. um, and uh, to understand their visual and auditory experiences. Most of these interviews I conducted uh, through video calls because at this time, uh, uh, last year, I think last summer, uh, pandemic persisted locally uh, in Karnataka. So I didn't want to take any chances. So the respondents shared their screens to display photographs and videos of their visits to the places. And they narrated their experiences and the virtual meetings accommodated a meaningful dialogical interview structure. So the prompts provided to the respondents were semi-structured questions about their visual and auditory experience at the temples. And the respondents ranged from lay people to professors, to architects, archeologists, musicians, dancers, uh, priests, um, a visually impaired person, um, an acoustician also among others. Um, so uh, the case study findings um, about the visual experience. Although these two temples differ in many ways, like the Basadi is simplistic and restrained in its exterior design and the temple, Hindu temple exhibits grandeur, I'll summarize both the temples, few of the common features. So both have the mantapa uh, with the Ranga mantapa or the performance hall inside, the Sukhanasi or the entry chamber of the Garbhagriha or the sanctum and the sanctum itself and the, or the Garbhagriha. So they both also have these late turned pillars, which are considered one of the most significant architectural accomplishments of the Hoysalas. And they both have these ceiling embellishments, which uh, at the Vaishnava temple are called as Bhuvaneshwari. So coming to the visual experience of everything at the Basadi, um, visual experience of people at the Basadi, some respondents looked for logical, practical interpretations in the visuals. Like there was this professor of architecture who visits these places with her, his students. He said that um, he's filled with construction logic every time he enters these places because there are some joineries which haven't used mortar or cement or anything, right? So they have just like uh, Guta Randra in Canada, they say it's just socket system, you know? It's mm -hmm. just joined without anything, without any glue, nothing. So he says he's like in awe and he's mesmerized every time he visits these temples and he's filled with construction logic when he enters these places. And uh, for another devotee, the image of Parshanatha, the 23rd Tirthankara, with the seven-hooded serpent over his head and his kind face and warm smile uh, instills deep humility in him. And he realizes that he's a shunya or he's a zero or he's nothing in front of this uh, Tirthankara. So a few others also shared that the stone imageries in these temples um, came alive to tell a story to them and they engaged in meaning making with these images and tried to understand the purpose and history behind the images.
uh, at the Chanakeshwa temple, which houses the main image of Vishnu, the architecture is treated sculpturally and exterior walls are filled with engravings uh, such as the Shala Banjikas or the bracket figures, um, uh, which are also called as Shila Balikas or damsels in Hindu mythology. They're in various dancing postures with musical instruments, which also point to the then existing influence of performing art on devotion. This temple also presented people with diverse place-making tools for religious ruminations, thoughtful introspections. Like for a few, this jagati or the platform, it turned into meditation spot. And the artwork prompted speculation and theories about their origins. Like this English professor who mentioned psychical distance theory by Edward Bullo and commented that there is something called as under distance and over distance in art. And if you're too close to an object of art or too far from it, it is difficult to appreciate it. So you have to be at the right distance to appreciate it. Um, and the visitor's state of mind when they enter and exit the temple is also based on the aesthetic visuals that they see, which the Hoysala artisans have tactfully handled. So the art invokes a sense of warmth in his entire being and intensifies the devotion he feels towards the uh, Lord Vishnu. Another devotee uh, shared that our ancestors were wiser than us and that to feel devotion in your heart, you need old temples. Uh, a well-known sculptor who is also a devotee informed me that it's vital to perceive a sculptor's purpose and to see in his work what he's trying to tell the society. Every perceptible sight that the sculptors offer through their handiwork has a deeper meaning behind it. So as someone who has also crafted the main deity image in several temples, he shared that devotion is something which is intensely personal, inexplicable emotional experience that can recurrently provide a cathartic release. So coming to the auditory part of it, although the worship rituals um, are part of the daily routine at these temples, only the Chenakeshava temple still continues to have music and dance performance offerings as part of its rituals. So as a result, even though I theorized about the acoustic properties through common components of both these temples, the respondents could only offer their feedback about live performance and sounds at the Chenakeshava temple. So there are many scholars who argued that performance and sensual facets of rituals and in, are intrinsic to Jain devotion and also to Hindu devotion. This also implies that sound is a central requirement for complete experience of performing rituals in both the Jain and Hindu temples. Texts like Natya Shastra also emphasize the importance of good acoustic quality which would necessitate that these acoustics be considered in the temple construction to determine the proportions of temple interiors to provide superior sound quality. Many experiments have been done on Indian temple acoustics by scholars like Prasad, Rajavel, Gupta, Rebakar, Omar Shankar Mantravadi, which also confirm the presence of acoustic properties in ancient temples. So I suggest that ceiling embellishments at both these places seem to be doing a similar job as modern day baffles, which are either hung on ceilings or walls to trap, amplify or disperse sounds and achieve diffusion or scattering of sound to cut reverberations. An acoustician uh, among the respondents also claimed that form always followed function in these temples. Even the buildings, shapes, engravings, and distances at which stone pillars are placed in these temples are crucial to sound production and reception. So as per him, keeping the Garbhagriha or the Sanctum uh, at the center, the performers back in the day would sit on either side mm -hmm. of the Sanctum, facing uh, the Sanctum um, at an angle of 60 or 72 degrees. So if the singers performed on one side of the Garbhagriha, bells, gongs, and other instruments would be played on the other side so the audience assembled behind the performers could enjoy what we now call stereophonic surround sound. Um, the musician at the Chenakeshava temple states that temple offers a naturally well-balanced acoustic environment for music performances. While he performs at other venues, he does not get the joy or the ananda that he gets in this particular temple. A visually impaired devotee, he uh, described his, that the sound texture in this Hausala temple is very unique uh, and it pulls him into a state of overpowering devotion. The main priest also shared that he finds the difference in sound propagation between the Garbhagriha and other temple spaces mm -hmm. as it reduces his vocal effort, especially when he chants uh, the mantras or uh, Om or Om Karna. 
So I have shown that uh, the ancient Indian practices of uh, temple creation rested not only on religiosity, but also on the effective harnessing of the natural elements and those elements participation in the stimulation of human sensations, like visual and auditory, which we see in these temples as their architectural components acted as placemaking tools. The, this work has religious perceptions of sensory experience with varied methodologies that include textual analysis, ethnography. It contributes to the existent knowledge or base of the Hoysalas, their religious fluidity, the sensuous aspect of Jain and Hindu worship, and Karnataka's medieval architecture. Although the existing acoustic properties cannot be determined because of the later environmental changes, in the future, I plan to orchestrate scientific ways to corroborate my findings on the acoustical properties that currently exist at the temples with appropriate uh, equipment measuring uh, with the help of sound engineers. Conduct on-site interviews and meet with overseas tourists to gather their accounts of being amidst Indian historical art and culture. The South Indian Jain and Hindu devotion in medieval Karnataka definitely needs further scrutiny and analysis on their evolution. There are endless opportunities for me to continue exploring this inter rich intersection of South Indian temple architecture, performing art, and people's affective states. So I would like to conclude by saying that I witnessed these temples, I listened to the respondents, and it made it clear to me that the reason for devotion and how they feel it may vary. Devotion can be possible without sounds, without music, without visuals, or without even stepping into a temple, yes. But devotees do bond with their higher beings using multiple senses. As someone who until recently believed that temples were not necessary for devotion, I realized through my field research ethnographic interviews at these temples that they do work well in this placemaking process of healing and nurturing the visitors and strengthening the devotees' intimacy with their respective jinas and deities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. This has been wonderful. Um, I think we can we can open it to questions, right? And I just want to say, you know, if I can start, and I, I want to say that really thank you for this first of all wonderful presentation and really for for your work because you combined so many things in your work. You had to pay attention to religious devotion, to theology, to architecture, to theory, to ethnography, textual study, contemporary developments. And you know, we, we all know how you know hard it is to kind of have a comprehensive enough understanding of what's going on in every of those you know fields and realms. So it's really you know a lot, wonderful and very very insightful thank you very much for that thank you and uh, of course you know there are so many discoveries in your work one of them of course is attention to acoustics uh there has been a lot of studies you know but no one really paid attention to that and no one thought about that and also how you you know we talk about sensory experience a lot uh in the field of religious studies but you um show how that sensory experience is important at really every level at every step of temple experience for instance how you talk about the transition from uh, being outside in the brightness of outside and the entering and then transitioning towards the Garba Griha, towards the sanctum, where it's really dark. And, you know, we all experience that. And it's actually a huge contrast. And it takes, as you as you mentioned in your dissertation, in your thesis, it takes a little bit of time to even get accustomed to the darkness, right? And that those few, maybe a minute, maybe 30 seconds, you know, of uh, trying to really not to bump into someone else getting out of the sanctum at the same time trying to see the deity that you really came there to see to get the darshana I mean all of that matters you know and all of that has some meaning and I think you were very good about identifying that and pointing really you know pointing to that because I don't think that has been you know that has been discussed as much at all mm -hmm. so thank you for that um, and if I can just ask my first question and then I will not speak as much uh, and that is about um, you know, you speak about how about the place place making device and how really all of those different elements of temple architecture um, are tailored, as you say, right, uh, to uh, eliciting or to enhancing may, maybe uh, people's uh, sensory experience. But I wonder, and then you're speaking about it as a humanizing device, right, as something that humanizing humanizes the space. But to what extent I think it does a little bit of the opposite. It takes it, it makes it less, um, 
Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say, less human in the sense, less normal, less less ordinary. Uh, instead of humanizing, maybe it's, it, it divinizes it or, or makes it uh, or tr transcending uh, something that is uh, unusual. And I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to point to is that while all of those things are so perfect as you're describing, to what extent we can speak about the excess of sensory in input? Maybe the music is too loud. Maybe it gets too dark. Does it get too crowded? Does it get actually uncomfortable in terms of the sensory experience? And that may also contribute to some kind of different, you know, way of um, per perceiving yourself and perceiving where you are. Yeah, so I would like to give two examples mm -hmm. regarding this. Um, so out of these 26 uh, interviews that I, different people that I interviewed, um, there was one lady who said she hates going to temples <laughs> because of this. She said there are too many people, yes. there's too much noise, it's too, too hot. Also, percussions no and conches and bells being played and performed. And um, she doesn't like too much stimulation. And she prefers to offer worship at home mm -hmm. in the peace and quiet in solitude um, through her floral worship. And that's it. And um, so yeah, there was this one person, I do mention that in the thesis writer, that she she didn't want to go to temples at all. <laughs> and there was another uh, devotee visually, uh, he's blind, uh, visually impaired. So for him, it was all about the sound. So he didn't get any of the other sensations, nothing. It was about sound and of course, uh, smell and touch and other things, but he couldn't see anything. Like this place is filled with art, right? So he wasn't overstimulated by the entire uh, art or uh, the structure of the temples. Mm -hmm. um, and even uh, uh, his devotion, he, he was born uh, since his birth. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was, sorry, he was blind since his birth. Mm -hmm. So even when he was experiencing devotion uh, in the temples, he's like, um, I can't pictureize the uh, deity image. So whatever instrument or if somebody is chanting a mantra, he just visualizes that person. And if somebody is playing the conches or the bells, he just visualizes those instruments. Mm -hmm. So for him, it is just those sensory uh, connections and nothing else visual. So yeah, I had like these two uh, examples that right, I could right. uh, offer. I hope that yeah, no, answers that's definitely question. interesting. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not always this fantastic potential experience of complete black bliss yeah, right yeah it could be the opposite yeah, and it could be also meaningful because it is the opposite yeah, you know yeah yeah and i yeah. think people usually ex encounter uh, are overly stimulated during these processions on special occasions that happen there um especially at the chenakeshwa temple which where live music happens and they're playing the instruments the drums the very loud yeah very loud with loudspeakers and uh, even in the inside the sanctum, the mantras are being chanted, and visually everything is lit up. Uh, so I think that's right. that's when yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Done. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, but let me commend you on the completion of uh, what I think to be an excellent, you know, thesis. Um, like uh, you said, um, you combine so many things in this work. And what I liked most was the ethnographic, uh, which you achieved in spite of the restrictions imposed by COVID. Uh, I would have criticized you for not locating yourself in the text, but I realized that was not possible because uh, you could not participate a lot in the activities that you, uh, your respondents were talking to you about because of the death restrictions of COVID. So I didn't see much of you in the text, but that is that you can explain that, you know. Uh, it was well organized um, uh, and richly textured, you know, work. Uh, at the master's level, I've been here for so many years. It's one of the, you know, uh, excellent thesis I have seen completed by a master's student. So congratulations on you, you and your supervisor, you know, that. Um, I have two or three questions. Okay. Oh, the first question has to do with the conceptual framework that you used, uh, placemaking. 
how would you revise this conceptual framework on account of your findings? Uh, because when sometimes when we use already existing you know frameworks or works, we 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 don't only build on it. Maybe there's a gap in what is there, and your findings would contribute to you know an enrichment or enhancement of the concept. So on account of what you found, uh, the uniqueness of your work, what's how would you revise you know uh, place making, that's a religious place making? Yeah, I think. Uh... Um, I think I can continue the same answer that I gave previously to Professor Restifo. So uh, placemaking is about making public spaces meaningful. So that means it has to cater to the entire population that's coming and using the public spaces, which is not practically possible. Um, everybody has different needs, different requirements to feel happy or joyful to connect to a place. So I may connect to a pond and Maya may connect to a tree or somebody else, uh, Louis may just want to sit on a bench and relax. <laughs> so I, we cannot cater to everybody's needs and uh, expectations in placemaking. So it's not, I don't think it's just limited to, uh, I, I know you're asking about pertaining to religious architecture, but I think placemaking theory in general, uh, that's where it falls short that you cannot really, even the designers, you cannot cater to everybody's uh, requirements and necessities to connect to a place. Even if, even if they are taken care that everybody is happy or everybody is fulfilled in this place and they, they enjoy this place, there might be some who may not feel that way, like the lady who, uh, I gave example of the lady who doesn't like the temples. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think uh, if I had to revise this theory, I don't know. I, I may have to come up with separate spaces for each person or individual using the place and ask them specifically what they are looking for, uh, which I don't think is practically possible. Okay. Good. Uh, let's talk about uh, Dashana, yeah. uh, which which is a concept I I saw perform myself when I was a student like you uh, working in Ghanaian Hindu temples. Um, what I observed, and maybe it might be different in India, is that Dashana is uh, a trade in visions. So the devotee is gazing at the Muti, but the Muti is also gazing at the devotee. Yeah. So it's an exchange. Yes. Okay, so you suggest a revision, uh, not a revision, you know, you try to make us enhance the understanding of Dashana. Uh, it should not just be seen as a transaction between a multi and a devotee, but we should take into consideration the entirety of you know the temple space. Yes. Would you say that should include the trade aspect of Darshan? Um, what aspect? Sorry. The trade aspect. It's a two-way thing, oh. you know. Yeah, so, it, so it's 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 the temple also gazing at the the devotee as the devotee is gaining mm -hmm. from the temple's gaze, you know. Because to understand Dashana, we are looking at these two things. It's only one way. Yeah. It doesn't become effective if it's only one way. It's both ways. Yes. You are getting at the multi, the multi is getting at you, and then it becomes more effective, you know, that way. So if the entirety of the temple, you know, uh, which you understand that gaze that the devotee performs, will this will still, will still be an exchange? Is the temple also gazing at the devotee? Yeah. Or the devotee? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Darshana, it's been, uh, I have discussed so much about this. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Diana Eck, she wrote a book called Darshan, uh, which was so popular, uh, I think, back in the day. And then it was critiqued by John Court um, that uh, Darshan, she does mention, I do mention her here, she does mention that. Uh, uh, India is a land where uh, uh, worship rituals can be sensuous, but she also says that uh, she puts too much focus, uh, importance, gives too much significance to visual, visual exchange um, between the deity, the main image, and the devotee or the visitors. But in this case, like you mentioned, I am talking about the entire, uh, the entire temple space. It starts from the threshold of the temple, the gateway of the temple, the gopuram, and then uh, slowly approaching the, the main sanctum. Um, 
And also darshan to me is not just visual. Mm -hmm. It is includes all the sensations yes. that you can feel. Okay. Um, so because the blind devotee that I interviewed, he said he goes for darshan. In Kannada, he said, darshana kauptini. He goes for darshan. Ha, he said he used the word darshana. So darshana, for him, it was still a darshana, yeah. even though okay. he cannot see it. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So I it don't goes beyond vision. It goes beyond vision. Yeah. And also, uh, you spoke about humanizing. Uh, so when these, uh, I have read uh, uh, these texts where they mention that uh, when they were constructing these temples, they did not look at these temples as non-living things. They treated these temples as living things. They mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if uh, one temple was constructed, the prototype, and they would want to copy that design and put it elsewhere, that would be called the daughter of that other temple yeah. or the son of the other temple or the sister or the brother. So they treated the temples as humans, like as living beings. So when they... Uh, created these artworks on these temples, like the dancers or there's so many artworks, like 10,000 or 10,000 artworks on these temples. Mm -hmm. So they did mean the exchange. Yeah. They did mean for this exchange to happen. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they treated the temple as a living being. So when a devotee or a visitor visit, visits and sees and enjoys these views and images, mm -hmm. they did want the exchange to happen. That's clear. There's almost a relationship that is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Connection. Yeah. Good. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If uh, Professor Akhtar, maybe Professor Bowman, if you have any questions. Whitney, do you want to go first? or you? No, you can go first. You're on the committee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, no, I, th I mean, this is excellent, and I, I really appreciate the um, the diversity of sources and kind of engagement. I think that you are using sort of not only across traditions, but also, um, you know, sort of the oral, um, the aesthetics. I mean, you know, you did a very, very good job, I think, of the interdisciplinary. I think the other uh, question that I wanted you kind of to think about uh, and engage with is like, what are the, I mean, this is, you know, totally outside of uh, the kind of some of the work that you're doing, um, but, you know, how does it engage with um, technology and modernity? Um, and I think that that, you know, so you can have you know, some of this stuff, um, you know, people are doing virtual pujas now and things like that. What does that mean? Um, how do you deal in a situation where um, you're having people of who are not, you know, so how, you know, I think sort of, so there's a couple of things like thinking about, you know, just kind of the larger context of what's happening, right? So like, not just the technology part of it, but like Indian society is changing. As you're saying that, you know, young, for instance, young people, they're not coming to the temples as much. Um, uh, you know, all of these sorts of things are the constructs, the ritual constructs and the physical spaces that were part of medieval, you know, sort of, you know, classical medieval society um, and people's needs and their adaptation has like, you know, changed as well. So I kind of want you to, you know, also engage a little bit with sort of the, and I know it's pushing you a little bit more outside of your, you know, your, what your expertise is, I think, you know, in terms of the, the discipline, but I think that's something that I think would be helpful, especially as you try to um, uh, do this interdisciplinary work is like, what are the the interesting questions that could make, that tell us something about kind of how it's being engaged with by people today? And what does it tell us about the nature of how um, aesthetic, oral, ritual worship has shifted um, in the contemporary period? Um, so I think that's just something that I, I wanted you to just think about is, um, you know, one of the things I think you were you were talking about earlier is that they wanted to construct a, a temple in London that was like exactly the same one, right? Or Not thinking about a uh, yeah, yeah, right. And that again, that would have you know uh, 
electricity, uh, air conditioning, uh, probably speaker systems, right? So like all of these things, um, you would have something that's quite radically different and, and yet you're trying to achieve the same thing. And so, you know, how does the use and the inter, you know, and people are coming to the temples with their smartphones also, right? Um, so things, there are all these other levels that I kind of wanted you to, um, to, to engage with, I think, in technology and modernity in those questions. So it's not really a question that I have with you, but these are just like ideas. I think as you go forward, you'll have a few years to do this research. Just think about it and be a little bit more aware of it. Because I think in terms of religious studies, sometimes we're like, okay, we're thinking literally about the aesthetics. We're thinking literally about ritual um, within those frames, but everything is happening within larger contexts, you know? Um, so anyway, that's just, that's my idea. But Great work. I mean, exceptional. I'm so happy that you were able to work with Professor Restifo and like, you know, bring this to an amazing conclusion and that you got, you know, a wonderful university interested in your work. So congratulations. Thank you. And yes, I am actually waiting for the new Hoysala style temple to be over so I can go and do some comparisons <laughs> and understand what they're doing and what's different about it. But because Adam Hardy is designing it, I think he'll try to uh, maintain the authenticity of the Hoysalas. Uh, anyway, I hope so. Let me see. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. What if it do what if he doesn't? Well, and like I'll be so mad time. at him. <laughs> well, no. well, that's interesting. Why so? Why so? No, why so? Because would it mean would would it mean would it be offending? Would it be uh, what what is what is wrong about that? If there are some innovations. Uh, innovations, I don't mind, uh -huh. but like Professor Akta said, the uh, ACs and uh, electricity, over usage of electricity in the temples, mm -hmm. which they don't do in, in these temples right now, only it's only at night time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, like the new newer temples. Um, you think it will ruin something? Yeah, it, yeah. Will, it will ruin it. It will ruin the experience. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but the, the, the devotees will define the authenticity of that experience. You know, it's not a, a comparison with the past that will determine the authenticity. It's how how they feel about that experience. It might be the same as people felt it some thousands of years, yeah. you know, back. That's true. Mm -hmm. Professor Professor <laughs> yes, okay. Sorry, I was, I was making sure there wasn't more conversation. Well, I'm very excited about this, and it's been great to watch uh, the development of this from modern analysis all the way to now, and you've done well at going to conferences, and congratulations on your acceptance to the doctoral program. This is all very awesome, so um, congratulations to you. Um, so um, the, only, the only question I had is that um, you had mentioned You've mentioned very well in your thesis the like the elemental components of the temples and sort of how they combine the elements um, and this sort of thing. But I was wondering how are the you mentioned the three different architectural styles, and I was wondering how they um, are influenced by the specific different ecological surroundings or geography, or how is and another way to sing is how is place making related to the the sort of non-human geological surroundings and this sort of thing. Um, with each of the three temples, or maybe they're not. Uh, or th each of the three different styles, rather, of architecture. Okay, so you want to know the how these uh, elements are incorporated in the three styles differently, or just, or just how how are the the different styles that you mentioned are they influenced by the different geographies where they're uh, where they're located, right? So the the yeah. non-human sort of. Uh, a geography of the of the places how does that influence the overall yeah I, coming to geography i think most of the temples all three categories uh they go with hilltops mountain tops mm -hmm. uh because they feel that's where they can harness these natural elements the most um and coming to the other factors uh of the temples uh, I don't really know the specifics of the geography for different temples, but I do know that uh, they get into this astrological uh, studies and astronomy uh, of the place, of the patron, and of the deity that's going to be installed. So yeah, that pretty much, uh, and also when they for the for. Uh, 
like Vesara temples, they have this different kind of mandalas, the Vastu mandalas that are drawn uh, from the Vastu Shastras. And for uh, um, uh, Dravida temples, it's slightly different. And for the um, uh, Nagara temples, it's slightly different. So when they're drawing these mandalas, they take into account the astrology of the patrons, uh, the, uh, the, the chart, the astrological chart. They study it. Um, and uh, also the the main uh, deity or Tirthankara that's going to be installed there, the image. So that's how it varies. But I don't know the exact uh, detail because it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah, not... sure. No. Well, I mean, I'm just like it's just like sort of in the. I was wondering if there's something like you know, in the the medieval Gothic cathedrals, like they have the the elements too, and then the the um, the the sort of uh the the big arches down the nave are supposed to mimic old book growth forest and they have them pointing uh the altar is to the east and the entrances to the west and the two arms of the cross point to north and south so i'm just wondering if they're like have that orients right people in the physical space around them and not just sort of the worshippers experience internally to the temple if there's anything like that yeah the spaces are divided yes like each uh um, there are zones, the temples are divided into zones, uh, like the northeast will be associated with uh, um, the element uh, water, so if there's any water body in the temple space, it will be in the northeast zone, um, and the east is for the temple, the main sanctum uh, of the temple, and uh, southwest, uh, it's it's to do with fire, element fire, uh, sorry, southeast is to do with element fire. So these uh, old medieval temples usually uh, used to have community kitchens. So these community kitchens where they cook and use fire would be in that southeast direction. Uh, so yeah, they do have these zones assigned, um, but if it affected the way they designed the exteriors, I'm not too sure about yeah. it. No, that's okay. Um, you don't have to be. <laughs> that's what, that's what there's always room to do more. <laughs> Great job, though. Thank you. Any other questions? Would you like to see you? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. I'm so proud right now. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Very rich, very rich thesis. And I particularly like your methodology. Perhaps the primary source text, the archaeological uh, report you mentioned, and also uh, theories and a field. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I can see a very good dissertation is on the way. <laughs> very rich. A um, couple of things. Um, I don't have a question. Just for the future, mm -hmm. when you work on your um, uh, dissertation or the book, when you go back, work with maybe archaeologists. Yeah, they know. I think that the sound, the the acoustic effect. I I am guessing from the Buddhist temples. Yeah, it's the roof, the connect. Yes. Somebody must have thought about that. Yeah. They must have done. So work with them. Whoever is working on. So the way that the roof. They make this sound, make this whole thing. So that's something in the future you can think about. You know, it's the acoustic. This is the fantastic. I like you to add the word function. Keyword, because this is something people are reading iconography, talking about the architecture. They forgot that, you know, add that function. Normally people don't play with it. That's another thing. Uh, 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 Professor, just now, um, you mentioned about trade because it's just so much going on. I particularly am interested uh, because I do Buddhist temples. Uh, something you can write a paper along the way to enrich this is in later on for your dissertation, where the incense comes mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. uh, which country. So there is a uh, cross-culture phenomenon involved because somebody has to send the incense because they kept burning it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's something, it's a good paper. When you figure those things out, then you can 
which is there is another aspect. And so when I look at this, you know, those kind of uh, things. Something I have been thinking about the Buddhist uh, temples caves, I haven't figured out. It's very complicated for the Jain temple, Hindu temple. I, I am thinking the uh, hierarchical um, locations when they chose, one of the professors mentioned it, when they chose this, you know, you talk about, you know, fire, you know, those elements. This, these things, I'm assuming they designed, you know, in a grand plan. So then is it, a, you know, hierarchical consideration when you do this? Those are kind of things. But right now, this is a very rich, excellent uh, um, approach. I love the questions you love. I think what pushes you is to be such an excellent student. We're so proud of the questions you ask. Uh, so that's uh, very good. But the other things we can think about later on. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Very proud. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From my peers, <laughs> my ideas. Uh, not anything really specific, but yeah, I'm super proud of you. This is a beautiful, eloquently like presented uh, thesis, and you really did. You have so many layers to your research, and there's so like much room to ask more. You know, so thank you for sharing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good group here. <laughs> I think Shane appeared and disappeared somewhere yeah. in between. <laughs> so, thank you very much. So, so if, if no one has any more questions, does it mean that we need to let Vani? Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. And it, right. And it's okay. possible to deliberate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, and I think I think all the non-committee members go too. Right? All the non-committee members. Yeah. Right? Okay. Bye. Uh, bye bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Bye, Bonnie. Um, that matters a lot. Thanks so much. Thank for our students. Um, yeah. Should we? I want to talk to you. Yeah. Do you, would you like all me to talk to you? Yes. Oh, no. With all of the faculty, you take a photo of us with the planning. Okay, we're going to take a picture. Just one minute. Yeah, we also have people on the ground. But people are live as well. So okay. uh, how can we? I think. Um, Let's start here. Oh, we'll, yes. we'll turn no, it that you're in the center. Just in... move it that side so it can. Uh, oh, I understand. Come. Okay, so you're going to be in the picture too, just to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, okay. <laughs> Say cheese. Yeah, you yeah, professors. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I'm worried. Yeah, just take a couple more. Yeah, the quality is there. Have some cheese for it. There you go. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, that out of the way. Okay. Nice, nice meeting you too. Nice meeting you too. Yes, me too. So very, very uh, mutual. Yeah. yeah. I would love that. We should get in touch. I would yeah. love that. Yes. No. Uh, yeah. Wait here. Yeah. Okay. Professor Yelvin, touch. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. So Thank much. you so much. Yes. Let's close the door. Thank you. Um, I can see also Felicia is still here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so you sent us the rubric. Yes. Uh, yes Thank yes, you, yes. Professor. Yes. <laughs> Um, one of the questions, you know, we, we, we try to answer at the, the deliberations is the category of, uh, thesis and defense. It is whether it's not just a pass or not pass, but, uh, it's not, it's an honest thesis. Uh, does it qualify to be considered an honest thesis? And that mm -hmm. depends on our judgment, you know, the quality of the work. And also the student GPA, which normally has to be, I think, beyond 
five. She's mm -hmm. far above. Yeah, she's the way above, right? Way right. above that. So okay. that's not out of the question. Okay. So it's the quality of the work, the presentation. Yeah, and and my I this is beyond honest. I mean, that's what I'm sure. <laughs> that's, that's my 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 conclusion. This is beyond yeah. honest. This Agreed, is yeah. it's really this thing. It's, it's read like a PhD thesis, exactly. you know, uh, for written by a master's student. Yeah. I agree so with that. And yeah. and, um, and it, for Vani, it's not only her thesis. Vani's uh, career as a master student has been superb. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the conferences and the writing. You know, she presented a paper in my class. You know, Rasta Voodoo Santaria class. You know, a paper on the Rastafari tradition and presented it. You know, nicely written. And so she's she's been one of the best students. You know, I think I have. I have encountered in this department, you know, yeah. Focused, uh, just above, you know, the normal. Um, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I haven't worked with her as much, but I think she's she's she she works as a PhD student right yes, now. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Way above the master's level. Her work is amazing. Her research is actual serious research. Very authentic. Very uh, independent um extremely hard working just yeah. wonderful and her presentation was absolutely beautiful yeah so yeah. yeah 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 and and coming from the background of uh, architecture you know mm -hmm. into the humanities you know uh, it's it's been so fluid so smooth for her you know and but that background makes her work rich True, yeah. but I think that's that's it. I think your background, because she grew up in a family of musicians. She's she's a professional singer as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, classical Indian singer, professional. Oh, okay. So she is really. I think she's been. Uh, she gonna absorb the, all of those uh, influences as a you know as a child, and then she did her degree in architecture, and I think it's now just blossoming into this new interest yeah. in a, in a, in, a, in a PhD in religious studies, where she brings all of those things together. together. Yeah, yeah. So I think, of course, she has a lot of um kind of background that helps her in this in this sense and yeah. the language also of course she knows the language you know yeah. where she when she goes there so she's capable of doing ethnographic work in Karnataka yeah which is very understudied uh as a as a place as a geographical location generally so I think yeah I think she's very impressive and uh, we're really lucky to have her yeah we should encourage her to uh, locate herself a lot more in, in her text you know I uh, see. Yeah. yeah so that we uh, uh, we know who is doing this and why this conclusion or that conclusion because mm -hmm. most of the time people remove themselves from the ethnographies and you know we, they don't give us a sense of you know where this thing is coming from so we the, the more we know her as a human being with this background with these qualifications with these skills the easier it is for us to understand, you know, how and why she's coming right. to this conclusion, you know. But I understand that given the COVID experience, you know, she could not be in the mid midst of uh, things. So mm -hmm. uh, it's reflected in the writing, you know. Yeah, but as she goes up, she should, because she does rich ethnography, you know, but her ethnography can be richer if she was located in the text mm -hmm. so that we see, we know how she's feeling, what she's thinking, you know, it becomes very transparent, you mm -hmm. know, for the readers. And that empowers the readers too, you know. Right, yeah. right. Right, that's that's definitely a very, yeah, it's a very good point. I think she had a hard time doing field work, but it's pretty incredible that she was still able to do this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, given yeah. the restrictions imposed by COVID. Yes. Yeah. He did yes. a good job. Delayed flights, yeah. and then everyone was scared, <laughs> and no one wanted <laughs> to speak. And yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So she still was able to accomplish it. But yes, it's a good point. Yeah. So I agree. I mean, she passes, of course, and um, it should be she should get honors for our department oh, for honest. this year yeah no doubt. she should be that, she should get that award yeah, yeah. agree yeah. yeah i think just yeah. from here on out just um you know uh sasha you can also just keep in a correspondence with her and keep talk, working with her and you know but it's it's really yeah, amazing actually. what you've been able to do um with her and, and i really appreciate you stepping in yeah you know? thanks yeah, i really i mean it was easy because i really enjoyed it she's very she's amazing yeah exactly okay great. um i have a question one question now that professor Rock, now that she comes in do we let you know what she that she's that she's getting honors and everything yes or, okay so yes, you, yes. So. she passes you can yeah we'll tell her yeah, yeah. We'll just, yeah you'll tell her that 
any any suggestions, any revisions? I I personally don't want to touch that thing. I think no. I think we just need to get her. <laughs> yeah, I, I think mean, we just need to get her out lovely. at this point, and um, yeah. let her just finish up, graduate, just get out, so she can start a PhD program. I think yeah, and then yeah, you know, she'll she'll work on this. She'll continue working on in her doctoral program. So I think it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and she should do something with this. Maybe she should start publishing some of this stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I you think know. she will definitely build on that because yeah. there's a lot to build on. Yeah. Should I let her in? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna call her. Is it just Vani or should I call everyone? Oh no. Uh -huh. is it? What's the role? This is Maya and Louis there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Everyone yeah. can come in. Would you like to come in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the good news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when, when you go to court and the deliberation is short, it means that it's an easy case. <laughs> <laughs> the, the situation here, he, we, we didn't waste too much time. It, we've all agreed that this is excellent. Uh, superb work, and not only your thesis, but your conduct as a student, you know, the years that you have been here, and your attitude, uh, um, your research work, and the fact that you could carry this out in a time where there was so much constraint on the kind of project you engaged in field work, you know, uh, we are all blown up, you know, with the results. Mm -hmm. And so you've not only passed, you passed with honors, you know, which is the highest we can confer. If those highs would have given that to you, they would have So congratulations, Thank you, you know, Thank yeah. You. yeah. And uh, Vani- Congratulations, Vani, yeah, this Thank is amazing. You. you did a wonderful job, we're very proud of you. And and we don't have to many suggestions. Any suggestions for revision? I, for me, it's okay the way it is. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it needs any. Revision. No. Yeah, we're no. just saying just submit it, and um, you know, uh, we did it, You you continue to work on it, right? Think of it as like kind of the beginning of a work on progress. So we don't have any revisions for you. Just submit it, and then um, we're looking forward to you just keeping in touch. Keep us updated as to like how your studies are going and things like that. And yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. And we'll find time and talk about ethnography, you and I. Yes. You yes, know, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And you know what? You should take credit for this very, very hard work and own it and be proud of yourself. It's <laughs> yeah. the moment to be proud. You'll have a lot of moments of doubt and uncertainty as you go into PhD and be thinking, God, I'm not good enough or this is terrible. Yeah, so no. just remember that, that, you know what, you'll get there. You'll have those moments, but because you're so hardworking and brilliant, you'll overcome all of those. And we are foreseeing a very bright future. For yeah. You. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You. All right. Take care, Thank guys. You, all right. We'll see you at, bye I bye. guess, at, at, I'll see you at noon then, 12 o'clock for Maya's, right? Tomorrow. Yes. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Take care, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.